Hello and welcome to my quirky review of the HP Spectre X360, a device that's seen a couple of revisions if I'm not mistaken. This is the most recent one. Uh, it was released in late 2016, uh, I believe earning a minor refresh in February of 2017 to add pen support. Uh, and a 4K option. But aside from those two improvements, this device remains identical to the one HP released approximately nine months ago. The configuration I have here has an Intel Core i7-7500U, 8GB of RAM, and a 256GB SSD. This will run you $1,080 at Best Buy, and I believe $1,100 on HP's website. Keep in mind that at the time of making this video, Best Buy is having a back to school promotion in which they knock $100 off most computers. So resultantly you can get this exact configuration for $980 at Best Buy, which is a pretty good deal. And we'll see why in this review. All right, now this is one of HP's top of the line laptop offerings, and it's their standard two in one device, which means that it folds back and can be used as a tablet in theory. The practicality of this two-in-one functionality, uh, I guess, varies depending on the user. I could see somebody folding this into a tablet if they need, if they're gonna watch a movie on a train or something like that. Something in which a keyboard is, you know, virtually unnecessary. But it's not exactly a selling point. I think this review will be considering this device as a laptop first and foremost as are most reviews of this device. And with that being said, we'll start with the build quality. So this is, I think, safely in premium laptop territory. The material choice is appropriate for the price point. Uh, it is made of machined aluminum, I think CNC aluminum, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's very premium feeling. Granted, if I compared this with the best built laptop on the market, which is the 13 inch MacBook Pro, I think that is borderline indisputable, uh, if not completely indisputable. This would fall slightly short. It's not exactly as premium feeling as Apple's MacBook line or current crop of MacBooks, but it's pretty close. If I were to grade the aluminum with Apple's being grade A aluminum, I'd probably put this at grade B aluminum. You can tell that the cut of aluminum is maybe one tier below Apple's caliber of cut, but it's still very premium feeling and build quality I don't think is going to be a concern for anybody. It feels like it's worth about a thousand dollars, but not much more to be honest. Design wise it's thin, it's roughly 0.55 inches thick, uh, and it's very compact. It's something you could definitely slip into a backpack, maybe even some larger purses. It is a very compact laptop, just you know, little hand comparison. I have, I guess, moderately sized hands. It's not the lightest or thinnest 13 inch laptop on the market, but it's thin and light enough for the vast majority of people looking for a 13 inch Ultrabook. So here's the lid of the laptop. You have the uh, revised HP logo. I think this looks sick. Uh, it's a vast improvement over their previous logo, at least in my opinion. And from just a purely aesthetic standpoint, I think that's not even debatable, but yep lid is very plain with the exception of the logo. The logo tends not to reflect in all scenarios, so sometimes uh, the logo is kind of concealed under some lighting conditions, so sometimes it will look like you're just rocking a no-brand laptop, which could be nice, I mean, maybe for stealth purposes, but that kind of hides the cool logo, so that's kind of a bummer sometimes. But On the bottom you have rubber feet and a long speaker grill for when the laptop's in a different orientation because of the hinge thing, and a few other smaller speakers bottom firing. Uh, on the left side, you have the power button, uh, a ventilation grill, headphone jack, and a USB Type A port. And then on the other side, you have a volume rocker, which is slightly unusual to see in a laptop, but I guess because this is kind of a tablet in some circumstances. It's justified, and it's nice to have, actually. I've been using it rather than using the software uh, volume adjustment. So, And then you have two USB Type-C Thunderbolt 3.0 compatible ports, which is definitely nice to see. The I.O. on this device is good, uh, borderline impressive, because not only do you get two USB Type-C ports, you also get a USB Type-A port for existing, you know, 
peripherals that use USB type A. My primary complaint with the Surface Laptop was the fact that it only had one USB type A port, which is definitely limiting. Um, but HP decided to stock this with, you know, a, a commendable, I mean, in this day and age, it's sad that it has to be commendable, but commendable array of input output ports. I just bought a couple of these for 10 bucks, um, which allows me to turn these USB type C ports into type A ports. So when necessary or when needed, I have three type A ports on my device. So I'll leave these in the description, but you know, these are versatile. That's fortunate. So you do have three USB ports regardless of their type, you know, the fact that you have three is nice. Now the defense for having only one is that, well, you know, you can just carry a dongle around, you know, so, you know, stop making a big deal about it. Thing is, this is, the point of this is to be compact and to have as less bulk in your backpack as possible. And when you're lugging around dongles and when you, you know, when you're at the coffee shop, it's kind of not that sightly to have a dongle jutting out of your laptop, you know? That's not, yeah, that's not Starbucks tier. It's kind of unbecoming to see it. So overall, external design and build quality are very good. It's pro it's one of the better looking laptops in existence, I can tell you that. It's not the thinnest or lightest because it doesn't have to be. Usually laptops that are thinner and lighter make compromises in other areas. And ultimately, I mean, it's usually just a dick measuring contest. So I'm fine without that. Uh, it's nice that HP didn't really go that route with this laptop. They went that route with the HP Spectre, the 13 inch one, but not this one. So that's nice. Okay, now we're running into a bit of a complaint. The device is very difficult to open one handed. And by that, I mean you can't open it one-handed. Even if I try shimmying it up, it's not going to open. I need to hold the bottom down in order to open it up, which is, you know, kind of unfortunate. So it's not a one-handed device. If it's, yeah, I don't like it, but for that to be one of my biggest complaints with this laptop is, I think, saying something. Because it's such a first-world problem that nobody should even care. I mean, at the end of the day, but it's just something to know. Okay, so let's briefly breeze through the different modes of this 2-in-1 contraption. When you open it up like this, you are in laptop mode. When you open it up like this, this is tent mode. So you can use it as a stand if you're on a train and you're watching a movie or something. And then this is tablet mode, in which you hold the device as if it's a tablet and you utilize the touch screen and stuff like that. I don't know if there's another mode, but frankly not that important. The fact is it's flexible and although you probably won't even be using the other two modes 90% of the time, it's nice to have. And a flexible hinge is good for more than one reason. It's not only good because you can use the device as a tablet or something like that, it's good because the hinge can rotate as far back as you want it to. So with quite a few laptops, the hinge only rotates the display back maybe 110, 120 degrees, which is less than ideal for some scenarios. So for example, the Asus ZenBook UX330 UA, one of the best selling ultrabooks on Amazon, has a restrictive hinge in the sense that it can't go back further than 110 degrees, which I mean kind of sucks. Because what if you're in a situation in which the ideal viewing distance requires the display to go back more than 110 degrees? You're kind of screwed and you just have to make do with the maximum angle. Not with this. If you you can lay this flat, like you can type an essay while like in the most awkward position known to man. And it's doable because the display is still viewable. That rhymes for a reason because it's true. You can have this, you know, staying upright because the hinge just allows you to do that. So even if you don't use the other positions, it's nice to have a flexible hinge so that you're not restricted by the hinge's limitations. All right, now let's talk about the keyboard. Uh, it's a silver keyboard, which quite a few people do not like because in certain angles, you can't see the lettering on the keys, which is kind of annoying to be honest, but once you get used to the keyboard, you should know where the keys are, especially if you know how to type. Um, <laughs> but there's another thing that's wrong with this and we'll get to it, that in a second. Um, but there is a backlight, there's only one setting and it's not the best backlight in the world. Uh, it is slightly uneven but it's barely noticeable in most circumstances and for most people. 
but it you know it's not the best backlight in the world but it's there so that's better than not having a backlight the keys are satisfying to type on the keys themselves are satisfying to type on uh they're not mushy uh they're very tactile they bottom out satisfyingly uh very good keyboard in terms of just a pure from a pure keyboard uh standpoint um and by that i mean just the keys themselves because the layout is kind of weird um, so HP decided to dedicate a whole row to sh like shortcut buttons like page up page down and home I seldom use these buttons so it's kind of an inconvenience to have them there because it shifts the entire keyboard leftward so it definitely takes quite a few hours to get used to the keyboard uh, you're going to hate typing on this at first because you're going to be always one key off especially if you're a touch typist you're going to be one key off all the time until you get used to it and if you alternate between laptops it's going to be a pain in the ass to be quite honest to be switching from laptops and then coming back to this one and then having to get used to it for a few minutes before being able to type comfortably on it uh, fortunately i only have one other laptop so i can i can adapt accordingly but this is definitely a drawback in my book i think these buttons should have just been hidden un under function keys like normally because you know this you're used to having the shift button here the enter button here backspace should be you know extended to the end of the keyboard because there have been several times that i pressed home when i intended to press backspace you know as i was learning the keyboard uh, ironically i was making so many mistakes and then when i was trying to correct the mistakes i was hitting the wrong button <laughs> so it's it's kind of, i think it, it was a pretty stupid decision overall to put these here I don't think this is going to be here a year from now. I think the next Spectre X360 is going to have a better keyboard. And by better keyboard, I mean a keyboard that's, you know, laid out normally. Because I, I think HP knows they screwed up here. That's the thing, though. If this, was, if this wasn't a thing, the page up, page down row of function keys, this would be a fantastic keyboard. It would, I mean, this is already the best keyboard I've owned personally, but, you know, I do have to knock it a few points down for the fact that there is an inconvenient row of keys that I don't use and shifts the keyboard over, which makes it kind of inconvenient to type on. Um, but again, in terms of key quality, these keys would get like a hard 9 out of 10. Uh, not a flaccid 9 out of 10. <laughs> There's a difference. And then we have the trackpad, which is kind of weird looking because of the aspect ratio. It's a widescreen trackpad. If I just coined that term, of course. I'm a natural. I appreciate the width of the trackpad, but I don't appreciate the length. I personally use the length of the trackpad or my trackpads more than I do the width. So to have a wide trackpad while a welcome thing is something I would have rather seen uh, extended to the length of the trackpad. Now I know in order to you know, perfect this whole combo of speaker, keyboard, trackpad, they couldn't make the trackpad lengthy. But, you know, the new MacBook Pro has a glorious trackpad because it's wide and it's long. This is just wide. It's not that long. And there, there are more than a few occasions in which I scroll and hit the top of the trackpad because I just use the length so liberally. So it's, it's nice that it's wide. I just wish it were long. But it's understandable given the fact that they needed to put the speakers here and they needed in order, you know, they had to figure out this whole keyboard mess and things like that, or, you know, how they were going to do this. So they had to sacrifice that. Now the trackpad itself, this is my last major complaint with the entire laptop, uses Synaptics drivers. Now this issue will not matter to, I think, 80% of people who watch this video. Maybe more. I, I don't know. If you're, if you're a tech head, if you're, you know, if you're a nerd, this will probably matter to you. So I, I don't know. I don't know what the proportion of nerds to non-nerds are that are watching this video. But now Microsoft has their own drivers for trackpads called Microsoft Precision drivers or Microsoft Precision certified trackpads. It's a crop of trackpads that are usually found on more premium laptops that are certified in terms of hardware and software to be optimized for Windows. So essentially, they're the best trackpad drivers you can get on Windows. HP has refused to use precision drivers in favor of Synaptics drivers. Now, 
There isn't a huge difference between the two. In my usage, the main difference comes down to inertial scrolling. So when scrolling through Microsoft Edge, because Edge is optimized for smooth scrolling, I have switched over to Edge from Chrome because of this. Um, in Edge, scrolling is so seamless with Microsoft Precision. With Elan and Synaptics drivers, not so much. You get a sort of like, it, like it, it doesn't feel as fluid or natural when scrolling. And I use two finger scrolling a lot. It's something that Apple has mastered with their MacBooks. It's something that the Surface laptop has mastered with its optimization with the trackpad and everything like that. The Spectre kind of falls behind in this respect. But there is a way to install precision drivers. It's actually just surfaced in the last month or two. There is a method, somebody on Reddit posted a method to install precision drivers. I'll leave the link in the description if you're interested on non-precision devices. It worked on my Lenovo Y510P, which is a gaming laptop from 2013. And it works on this with one exception. When I wake the device up from sleep, the driver doesn't work as ideally anymore. It works like it's a synaptics driver. So I can't put the device to sleep if I want to take advantage of this technology. So that's kind of a bummer. Until there's a workaround, I'm trying not to put this device to sleep because I prefer using the precision drivers that much over the synaptics drivers. The synaptics drivers though are good. It's just that inertial scrolling is so valuable to me as a nitpicky you know, tech nerd of a consumer. Most consumers, like average consumers, couldn't care less you know, most consumers purchase MacBook Airs despite the fact that they have crappy displays and outdated hardware. Most people wouldn't care about this trackpad thing. It's just something that is of note to me and to quite a few tech nerds. Now the feel of the touchpad is great. It's a glass touchpad. Uh, it's very smooth. I mean, the appropriate amount of friction, I guess. Uh, it's, it's a great trackpad. No complaints in terms of feel, and even dimensions, although I would have preferred it to be a bit wider because it kind of looks weird like this, and you know, when I do two finger scrolling, it'd be nice to be able to scroll just a bit more before hitting the edge. With the standard stock synaptic drivers, it's a good touchpad. Not the best in its class, but it's it's capable, and most people won't, won't be inconvenienced by it. But with precision drivers, it's an objectively better trackpad or touchpad or whichever term but it's still kind of buggy because it's you're just you're just performing a workaround by installing precision drivers the other way the reddit way or you know i'll leave the link again in the description but it just proves that the software is what's holding it back from potentially being the second best trackpad on the windows side of hardware um with the best one being the surface laptop i mean that trackpad is godly um but this is, I think, a better feeling trackpad. See, the thing is, the Surface Laptop has, I think, a worse trackpad hardware-wise just because it kind of feels cheap. Um, but it's it uses Windows Precision so effortlessly that it's just a more pleasurable experience overall than this one is, even though this is more premium feeling to the touch um, due to the fact that it's just better embedded into the chassis than the one on the Surface Laptop is. Um, but yeah, okay, good trackpad, no more rambling about that. Um, good actuation on the keys, really good keyboard. And here we have the front firing speakers, because of course we have the speakers on the back for, you know, when it's in tent mode. Speakers are good. They're not as impressive as the 12-inch MacBook speakers are, uh, and the 12-inch MacBook is thinner, so it's not the best in its class, but it is pretty respectable, especially when you tweak it all up with the banging all of sun, um, audio whatever audio enhancement software that comes preloaded with this version of windows um you can make it sound go from sounding tinny to you know relatively full with eq adjustments and the bang and olufsen experience crap i disable that just because i'm a purist i don't like equalization in any measure even if it makes the device sound as sensibly better i just want to hear you know proper you know normal subdued equalization i i turned it off so disabled the speaker sound good but a bit thin which you know is fine but fortunately i don't use speakers that often i just hook up you know a usb dac and listen through headphones so it's not that big of a deal to me the speakers are good they're probably better than what you'd expect 
from a device of from a laptop of this size but that's probably because you haven't heard the 12 inch macbook speakers which are very very good and are definitely better than these now the 12 inch macbook is its own share of problems i mean which would prevent me from ever purchasing one so before you call me an apple fanboy know that i would never buy the 12 inch macbook at least in its current state uh, principally because I prefer Windows as an operating system, so so just know that before you sound ridiculous, I guess, in the comment section, but to be fair, you probably didn't get this far in the video to begin with. Alright, now let's look at the display. I think it's at, yeah, it's at like 0% right now, so, yeah. So let's put it up. Let's put it up at max brightness. It's 100%. Now, of course, this is a reflective display since it is a touchscreen, uh, but even with that being said, it does seem to be a bit more reflective than most glossy touchscreen displays, so that is kind of a bummer. But it does get fairly bright at around, I think, 330 nits, so it's you can counterbalance the glare with the, high, the relatively high brightness of the display. So uh, It is a pretty decent display. Now, it is 1920 by 1080, which gives you a PPI of, I think, 166. So it's definitely not the sharpest display out there. That's roughly the pixel density of the first gen iPad mini. So it's not very pixel dense, but you have an option. You either go for this one or you spend $250 more for the 4K display, which is more taxing on the CPU and GPU, thus uh, being taxing on your battery. Or you just forego that you deal with, you know, the not so pixel dense display and you get better battery life, less CPU throttling and far less GPU strain. Because the GPU in this is the Intel HD 620, which is not exactly the most powerful GPU out there. So for it to be pushing a 4K display, it's not going to be too pretty when it comes to, um, you know, display motion. I played around with a 4K Spectre X360 at Best Buy. It did have more difficulty keeping up with scrolling through web pages and such. Um, I would recommend getting the 1080p version, even if you are a stickler for displays. I, I myself am a, a stickler for displays. I wanted the 4K model, but ultimately I decided that the what the $250 price premium wasn't worth the worst battery life, which was going to, you know, adversely affect me in college when you know battery life is kind of important sometimes. Um, and, you know, scrolling experience or, you know, just UI experience in general was going to be sort of muted due to the fact that the HD 620 was undoubtedly going to stutter at times. So I went with the 1080p version and it's a decent medium. I mean, I would have preferred a 1440p display or something like that as a nice medium between di uh, display quality and battery life. But hey, I mean, 1080p is fine. But for the record, I do think 1080p is too low a screen resolution for a 13.3 inch display. I think 1440p should be the standard for uh, premium 13 inch ultrabooks because you're getting a significantly more pixel dense display at not much of an expense of battery life. That being said, we don't have that option. So I think the 1080p version is the best one to get cost wise and performance wise. But resolution aside, I mean, the display is good. Again, gets reasonably bright aside from the the glare on the display, which is probably the display's worst quality, the re reflectivity. It's a good display in practically all other measures. It's fairly color accurate. I think uh, it gets a 99% sRGB rating. So it's, it's a pretty good display. Or is it 97%? Anyway, it's pretty damn close to 100%. Um, I know it's Adobe RGB rating falls pretty short, but you know, it's still a relatively color accurate display. And for the average person, this is definitely going to be a very good display. No average consumer cares about pixel density. I mean, again, need I reference the MacBook Air, a 900p display, a TN panel, and yet it's one of the best selling laptops today. You know, it's not many people care, but it's a very serviceable display. I think that's the best way to put it glare considered. Um, I do apologize for the glare on camera, of course, but I, it's kind of laptop's fault. Sorry. Now in the box, this does come with a pen. I think it uses Ntrig technology, but don't quote me on that. It's decent, but coming from using an iPad Pro for a couple weeks, it's definitely subpar. Uh, it might get you by for not much. I mean, it's 
it's just a throwaway item in my opinion but you know if i wouldn't buy this to use the pen definitely not get an ipad pro if that's your main thing i do like the fact that the side bezels are relatively small uh the laptop does have a relatively large chin by today's standards at least for premium thousand dollar plus ultra books but i don't mind it um I, th I think it looks pretty nice i think the side bezels are the main thing like yes it would be nice to have you know large i mean smaller top and bottom bezels but if it allows you to put a webcam at the top i'm not complaining that much uh, I was considering the XPS 13, but I'm sorry. That that bottom left-facing webcam was almost a deal-breaker for me. That and the fact that I, it, the design is kind of utilitarian. I think this is a better-looking laptop than the XPS 13 is. Webcam is good. Decent audio, decent video. Definitely gets you by for Skype and things like that. So it's definitely one of the better Ultrabook webcams out there, uh, which is a, nice. It's fortunate that I can say that. Now the built-in DAC is very good. Uh, no complaints. It's very serviceable. Again, i use that adjective. I still prefer using my FIO E10K external DAC slash amp combo, um, but it doesn't fall far behind from it. Uh, it's a very serviceable DAC. I don't think you'll have any complaints. I do recommend disabling the Bangin Olufsen audio control. Again, as I mentioned previously, because it does I mean, screw up your <laughs> audio. It does affect headphone output too, so please disable it. Uh, better yet, I should just un uninstall it, but occasionally this comes in handy for making the speaker sound a bit more beefy, but other than that, it's it's a useless addition. But hey, I guess Bang & Olufsen designed these speakers around the fact that you're going to use the software they slapped onto the device, because not many people will go out of their way to uninstall it. But yeah. But yeah, no complaints, built-in audio DAC is good. Uh, and that's something I care about quite a bit, so good to know. All right, performance is great. Uh, this has an i7-7500U, clocked at 2.7 gigahertz. It's a dual-core processor. Um, very smooth all around. Again, I'm using Microsoft Edge with Windows Precision drivers, so this is probably not as ideal a scenario as if you're using Chrome with the stock drivers, because Chrome kind of... It's not really optimized for Windows or any platform for that matter. It sucks because otherwise Chrome is the best web browser far and away in my opinion. But of course, can't have everything. And you know, Microsoft Edge edges out <laughs> Chrome in terms of just sheer performance on Windows. But yeah, I mean very smooth. Having multiple Windows at once does not tax much of anything. 8 gigabytes of RAM is enough for virtually all people who are going to be using this, I think. Not many people are going to be video editing on this. It's an Ultrabook. First and foremost, you're prioritizing, you know, portability uh, and battery life, so it's not necessary. That's Scientology on me. Nice that Leah Remini is coming back for, you know, King of Queens-esque reunion. Uh, anyway, so performance is very good. It's snappy. In terms of gaming, I mean, yeah, you don't buy this for gaming, you know that. I don't need to insult you by telling you that. It has an i7-7500U, again, with an Intel HD 620, and that combination allows you to play maybe, like, Rocket League at low settings, maybe 50 FPS. But aside from that, if you're going to be doing anything heavier, uh, you're better off not buying this for that. I mean, you just, you know, buy something more equipped for that. You know, get something that does that and not this which doesn't do that. It's not made for that. So it's, it's kind of common sense when you think about it. All right, next, heat. Now, this is thin, and it has a relatively powerful processor in it. So the combination of the two definitely doesn't make one sit easy when it comes to discussing heat emissions. Um, and by that, I mean this does get hot sometimes. And it's it's centralized, fortunately, so you know to avoid it if you're starting to experience it. <laughs> experience it. Hepatitis C. Um, <laughs> it emits from the back left, or the, the rear left. So near the USB Type-A port, you'll feel a hot spot around this area when the fan is whirring, or when you're doing something, you know, taxing to the CPU. So if you have 20 tabs open in Chrome, uh, streaming a few 4K videos side by side, you're going to feel heats uh, emanating from the back left. And it's going to get pretty hot, like to the touch. 
it's going to be uncomfortable in your lap, but it's not going to be hot enough to the extent that it's going to prevent you from using it on your lap. It'll be mildly inconvenient, but it never gets hot to the point where you have to take it off your lap because it's going to give you burns otherwise. Um, so that's at least fortunate. Fan noise, you do hear the fan whirring from time to time. It only comes on when you're doing CPU intensive stuff and once in a blue moon when you're not doing anything on it. But other than that, uh, fan noise is not a problem. I come from a noisy gaming laptop environment, so I, it's a welcome, pleasurable change for me to not have to hear my device most of the time when it's doing things. The last thing we're going to talk about before we reach the conclusion uh, <laughs> of this exceptionally long video is battery life. Uh, and it's been pretty decent. Uh, I've been averaging around, I'd say, eight hours web browsing at 25% brightness uh, and doing things that I usually do, like maybe watching a movie in a VLC, in like a VLC window and then having a couple of tabs open in Microsoft Edge. I averaged around eight hours, eight and a half hours sometimes over the past week. I've been using this thing nonstop. And I've been consistently getting about eight to eight and a half hours doing normal things. Now, I tend to be pretty conservative with my screen brightness, which might result in my results being kind of exaggerated. Uh, because I'm sure if you cranked it up to 50% screen brightness or 75% screen brightness, you'd get on average about one and a half to two hours less on a charge than I would or I am getting. So if you're, if you're using this outside, maybe expect about six hours five and a half hours six hours if you have it on 100 percent brightness otherwise under normal lighting conditions i think 25 percent brightness is enough and in that case if you're using microsoft edge and you know you have a normal amount of tabs open like eight or nine <laughs> normal normal the definition of normal for number of tabs is kind of wide ranging so it's kind of unfair for me to put that moniker on it then i would expect about eight hours Maybe seven and a half if you're getting kind of carried away with it. But, you know, seven and a half to eight and a half hours expect out of a charge using it normally with Edge because Chrome will knock an hour off your battery life on average. So keep that in mind. But in terms of Ultrabooks, the battery life of the X360 with a 1080p display is average, which isn't a bad thing because average for Ultrabooks in terms of battery life is a full day more or less for most people so it's so it's not a bad thing to call it average for an ultrabook because it will more than likely last you all day if not most of the day and if you manage to run out of juice before the end of the day uh the charger is pretty compact and courtesy of usb type c technology uh fast charging is a thing with this so you'll be able to top this thing up in a little bit less than two hours on average so you know that's nice. It's, it doesn't take long to charge, relatively speaking, of course. And you get a good seven, eight, nine hours out of it. I know I'm extending it every time I mention it, but again, battery life varies quite a bit depending on the person you are and the programs you use. So it's, you know, there has to be a bit of a, of a range, and there definitely is. But if I were to archetype an average user, I'd say expect eight hours. But there we go. All right, and now the conclusion. This thing's been out for nine months, uh, if you are to count the late 2016 version without the pen supports. So a few people might be holding out for the new generation of Spectre X360. Um, and that version will probably not have the function row key thing, might be using Windows Precision Drivers, and might be able to be open one-handed, which would solve all three of the complaints I have with the current gen Spectre X360. So is it worth the wait? Honestly, I'd probably say yes. Intel just unveiled their 8th generation of uh, processors, which includes the ultra low voltage processors that are found in these Ultrabooks. And this year they decided to step it up with quad core processors in these uh, U series processors for the 8th generation. So there are strides being made in Ultrabook processors that will be available in upcoming Ultrabooks. Namely, the Spectre X360 when the revision comes out probably in around November of 2017. So am I wasting your time by making you watch the entire video until now to tell you that you should just wait until you buy until the new one comes out? Yeah, kind of, I guess. But I'm also here to tell you that this still isn't a bad buy. If you get this for $1,080, 
from Best Buy, you'll get something that will last you at least four years. HP has been making great strides in reliability recently. They've they've been infamous for their bad quality control, uh, you know, in the late in the mid to late two thousands. But I think now that they're targeting a premium market, their issues have more than likely resolved. And I think you can take them seriously as a company who produces high quality computers. So for a thousand eighty dollars, this is still a good buy. It's still one of the best Windows laptops you can get today. That being said, come November, come December, there will be laptops that will be released that will be superior. I mean, that's just what happens. Every year, there's newer and better technology. Granted, the jump from last year's laptop to this year's laptop is smaller than the jump from a laptop from 2013 to, say, 2014 was, but it's it's just the nature of the beast. You invest in something, something better is going to come out a year from now. And the fact that this is nine months old might not make it the best investment for a few people who are waiting for that eighth generation Ultrabook. So let's say you're in the market for an Ultrabook today and you need one now. You can't wait until November when all the new Ultrabooks come out with the new version of Intel's Ultrabook ultra low voltage processor. Is this worth it? I think for the price, $1,080 at Best Buy, I think it is worth it. I mean, you're getting a very capable processor, great battery life, a good serviceable display with the option for a fantastic display with the expensive battery life. So that's just a compromise you have to make now. There's no best of both worlds, at least now in late 2017, unfortunately. Uh, good trackpad, compact design. This has everything. It doesn't really cut any corners. I mean, there are a couple of questionable quirks with the design, as I mentioned in the video, like the lack of uh, one open handedable thing, but that's less of a cost cutting corner and it's just more of a misstep, um, in my opinion. So I think it's worth it. It will last you several years. You're not missing out on much if you don't wait for the eighth generation crop of Intel core low voltage processors. Yeah, they're probably going to be significantly more powerful just due to the fact they have more cores, but it's not power that you're going to be using if you're not video editing, which is not something I'd imagine you'd want to do in the first place if you buy something, you know, thin like this. Um, that being said, if you absolutely need to video edit, then it might be worth waiting for the 8th generation Intel Core crop. But because those new Ultrabooks are right around the corner, you can get good deals on laptops like this. I mean, $1,080 is probably not going to be the cost of the next gen Spectre X360 when it comes out. Um, you know, it's just not how it's going to be. HP sells certified refurbished X360s for around $850 to $900, depending on the day or the week, which if you're willing to take the gamble with a refurbished product, I think is worth it. That's a good deal. I mean, if it works as new, you're, you'd be getting a good deal. Now, in my opinion, the three best Ultrabooks you can buy today are the Microsoft Surface Laptop, the MacBook Pro 13-inch, and the HP Spectre X360. Now, not only is this the best value of the three, but it also has some things that the other two don't have, such as, you know, a respectable I.O. selection. Um, now, the other two has this one beat in terms of screen resolution and ultimately screen quality, and they both have the advantage of uh, hardware software uh, synchronization or, you know, um, they both they have a symbiotic relationship with the hardware and software since Microsoft manufactures the Surface Laptop and Apple manufactures you know their MacBooks and they both manufacture each respective operating system. But this is still a really good all-around Ultrabook. Yes, yes, the XPS 13 is good too, but in my opinion, the design is a bit too dated. Yes, I know, I'm kind of a <laughs> I'm a design whore. I really. I can't rock an XPS 13, I'm sorry, it just it screams run-of-the-mill, ugh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. I know the Infinity is just play, blah, 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 but, you know, the clamshell itself kind of looks like it's from 2012, or even worse, 2010. Um, sorry, it's still good, I'm not, I'm not knocking it down, if not, well, I am, but only for that, anyway. Now, there is an option that I didn't mention. If you're budget-minded and you want something like the X360, but you're not willing to pay for a refurbished unit, 
and you're not willing to pay the expense for a new unit, then there is an option for you. It's called the Lenovo Yoga 720. It's basically this, but a slightly worse version of it. And for significantly less money. You can buy the Yoga 720 with an i5-7200U. Yeah, it's not as powerful as the processor in this one, but there's only a slight difference. And in normal day-to-day -day use, you will not notice the difference. Same amount of RAM, same storage. Same design, uh, you know, comparable build quality. It's not as good. Uh, again, it's, it's slightly worse in practically all areas, but it's significantly less money. You can buy it for $730 now at Best Buy. And with a $100 student discount, you're getting it for $630, which is a fantastic deal. So if the deal is still going on when you're watching this video, and it, if you don't, if you feel uncomfortable shelling out nearly $1,100 for the Spectre X360, which I think is worth it, you can always go for the device that will cost $300 less that is almost as good in most areas as this is. So yeah, Yoga 720 is my definite recommendation for a flexible, uh, reliable laptop for practically anybody. Yeah, the display is relatively dim and it's not quite as thin and stylish, but I think for most people, it will ultimately be a better value than the Spectre X360. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. I will be happy to service you. Until later, thanks for watching. You've just been with Zy9, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye now.